I'm really delighted uh, to be here to introduce our final speaker of the day, uh, Professor Ellen Wall. So my name's Heather Viles and I'm the president of the British Society for Geomorphology. And I'm delighted that uh, we've awarded the David Linton Award for 2020 to Professor Ellen Wall for her outstanding contribution over a sustained period to fluvial research, mentoring, and the promotion of the discipline of geomorphology. Professor Wall is an extremely distinguished geomorphologist who's already received a number of important accolades and honors, including the EGU's Ralph Alger Bagnold Medal in 2017 and the AGU's GK Gilbert Award in 2018. She's particularly noted for her major scientific contributions to understanding how rivers function and her important applied work on river restoration. Furthermore, she's an exemplary reputation for supporting and mentoring graduate students and early career researchers. A prolific and engaging writer and communicator, Professor Wall has also done much to advance the understanding of geomorphology to wider audiences in the USA and around the world. So it's my great pleasure now to switch myself off, uh, turn off my microphone and uh, introduce uh, Ellen. Hi, thank you. thank you very much for this invitation to present and thank you very, very much for the award. I'm really honored to receive the Linton Award and my only regret is that I wish I could come to the UK to attend the meeting in person and receive it, but um, this is the way things are now. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is the idea of Spatial heterogeneity in rivers, and for shorthand, I call those messy rivers. Um, you could think of it as spatial heterogeneity as anything that makes a river look differently than an irrigation canal. I typically use an irrigation canal as, as my uh, shorthand because it's simple, it's uniform, it's homogenous. You, you don't want erosion and deposition along an irrigation canal, so you make it as uniform as possible. And of course, natural rivers are very different than that. Uh, and sometimes people perceive their um, spatial heterogeneity as messiness, as something that's unsightly and inappropriate and needs to be cleaned up. And I think that is a challenge for the river science community to work with people who are not river scientists to explain how rivers function and why that messiness is important. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. And a couple of things before I get into the more technical part. One is the idea that um, social scientists have referred to a shifting baseline of perception, which you can summarize as uh, everything that you have experienced in your life governs how you see things in the future. So if you are used to certain conditions, those are normal and expected. In other words, if you grew up in the middle of a, a city, a river, a straight river encased in concrete is what you expect to see for a river. So that's an extreme example, but what you're used to governs what you expect and what you think is appropriate. Second, um, the degree and the forms of spatial heterogeneity vary among different segments of rivers around the world. It depends on where you are in the catchment, uh, so I've referred to that as process domain, and where you are in the world, which you could think of as biome. And finally, there's this question of if um, more spatial heterogeneity or something more heterogeneous than an irrigation canal is good, uh, how much is good? What, what is natural? And I'm going to talk about all those concepts in parentheses in a moment. So let's start with shifting baseline of perception. I think a nice illustration of this comes from this textbook, which is um, an English textbook on river pollution. This is the inside front cover. And I think everyone who sees this would agree that that's not a good river. It's very polluted, very unpleasant. What I found really interesting was the opposing inside front cover, which is this picture of a boy and his dog along a very bucolic or pastoral river. And it's a nice contrast to the other one with the skeleton. But the more I looked at it, the more I thought, oh, that's not exactly what I would consider a really good example of a British river. Um, I had the opportunity to spend four months at Durham on a sabbatical a few years ago. And one of the things I learned that I surprised me was that Britain historically was completely forested. So if you look at that drawing, <laughs> there's not a lot of trees in there. And the more I looked at it, the more I was disturbed by this drawing, but I'll come back to this um, at the end of the talk, but it because of my baseline of perception uh, from working in forested river corridors in fairly natural environments in North America, I, I don't think that's such a great drawing, actually, the more I look at it. So that second part, environmental context, 
Process domain is sort of getting at where are you in the catchment? Are you in the headwaters? Um, are you in a lowland river? Are you in a canyon or a big alluvial plain? And biome is a shorthand for where are you on the globe? Um, these two rivers on the left, the river in the north slope of Alaska and the tundra versus the Brisbane River in subtropical Australia. Yeah, the basic physics are the same, but the biota is very different, the disturbance regime, um, the land use history. So the details of where you are in, a, uh, in the world make a difference in what types of spatial heterogeneity and what level of heterogeneity you might expect to find. And that third issue, what is natural, uh, most of us, including me, assume that less human altered rivers are typically more healthy or more functional. But what is natural? Um, you know, people have been around for millions of years, literally. In my part of the world, in Western North America, we usually assume natural is pre-European settlement. That doesn't work so well in Eurasia. Um, there's been intensive human alteration of landscapes and river corridors for far longer periods of time. So understanding the land use history and using that to inform what you're going to uh, use as a reference for natural is important. It's also a tricky question because natural systems are not static. They have a natural range of variability in inputs, um, fluxes through them and, and form. A lot of times in order to try and understand that natural range of variability, we will look for the least altered catchment or portion of river we can find. That's usually referred to as reference conditions. Those may not be present in some parts of the world if there's been intensive and prolonged alteration. Um, another approach is to try, whether you can or can't find reference conditions, to try and understand what the natural water and sediment regimes are. So what is the discharge regime in the absence of, say, diversions or flow regulation? Um, what might the natural inputs of sediment look like in the absence of changes in land cover? I'm going over all of these very briefly. They are extraordinarily difficult questions to answer, but they do underpin how we regard and how we manage or try to restore rivers. So when I think of a river uh, corridor, and I'm usually referring to something at the reach scale. So a reach is a length of river and valley that have consistent geometry that could be over tens of meters in a very small river or tens of kilometers in a very large river. But I think of at that reach scale, um, the interaction between fluxes into the river corridor and the primary fluxes in all rivers are water and sediment. In forested or historically forested catchments, large wood can also be a very important flux. I think of those fluxes of material passing through, into and through the river corridor as interacting with what are called context here. That's basically a function of valley geometry, which is, again, where are you in the network? Headwaters, lower basin. What are the lateral limits on the adjustment of the river? So the two inset photos here, the one on the left is the Colorado River in Grand Canyon. It's a very uh, narrow valley bottom. The Colorado River doesn't have a lot of room to move. The picture on the right is in the middle of the uh, Yukon Basin in central Alaska. Broad, broad floodplain, a very sinuous river. There's, there's essentially very large spatial limits. Uh, the erosional resistance of the channel boundaries and the, the floodplain boundaries or valley bottom also influence that valley geometry and the stability of the base level uh, can exert a big influence. So there's these natural characteristics of the valley geometry. And then I put human influence in here because we typically don't change the valley geometry, but we change how the river interacts with that valley bottom through processes like flow regulation, uh, bank stabilization, levees, channelization. So we, we alter the ability of the river to either experience fluxes of material or, so in other words, we alter the fluxes coming into the river corridor or how the river can respond to those fluxes. But that interaction between flux and context creates a series of characteristics and you can have lots of descriptions of those characteristics. I've listed a few here, things like spatial heterogeneity. And I'm taking the idea of spatial heterogeneity from landscape ecology. Landscape ecologists define patches that are spatially contiguous portions of a landscape that differ from adjacent patches. And those patches can be at a very small scale of centimeters, um, or they could be um, like a, the, an abandoned meander or um, the overbank portion of a floodplain. So they're, they're spatially variable. And they can be defined in characteristics that vary. So 
for river scientists, the spatial heterogeneity might be defined by um, the substrate and the stratigraphy or by soil moisture or by bed forms in the channel, um, by vegetation in the floodplain, etc. But spatial heterogeneity is one characteristic that results from these fluxes interacting with the context. Another is connectivity in three dimensions of various materials. Resilience to disturbance, so the ability of the uh, river corridor to respond, to recover after a disturbance. And geomorphic and ecological integrity. Ecological integrity is a phrase that's been around a lot longer. It's the idea that, or it's the um, measure of the degree to which the biotic community uh, approximates what you would expect to find in the absence of human manipulation. Geomorphic integrity comes from an idea that Will Graff described about 20 years ago, where he said a river has physical integrity to the degree to which it can adjust to changes in inputs. So how much can the context adjust in response to those fluxes? And if it's a highly stabilized river with regulated flow, it's not getting much variability in fluxes and it doesn't have much adjustment capability, so it has lower geomorphic integrity. And then below that, the uh, text in yellow is just examples of metrics that you can look at to characterize things like spatial heterogeneity or integrity. And all of these interactions occur in a river corridor. This is not my phrase, uh, but I've adopted it and I use it a lot to refer to not just the active channel, but also the adjacent floodplain and underlying hyperreic zone. And I think all river scientists are very aware that these three environments are integrated, but most of us, when we say river, we tend to mean or think of channel. And certainly people who are not river scientists, when they hear river, think channel. And of course, the, the fact that these three components of the river corridor are integrated is fundamental to river corridor process and form, but it's often ignored in management and in regulation. I'll, I'll use the United States as an example. Navigable waters in the channel are under federal jurisdiction. Floodplains are under private ownership typically. And in a regulatory and legal sense, those two are completely separated, which is ludicrous in terms of um, the way landscapes and uh, river systems actually operate. But I think referring to a river corridor makes these connections more explicit as illustrated in this three-dimensional block diagram from Harvey and Gusev's paper, where they were talking about the three-dimensional nature of water and solutes moving through, into and through a river corridor. So I think explicitly describing or thinking in terms of a river corridor helps to emphasize those interactions between physical process and form, biogeochemical reactions and biota, whether it's the big visible biota like riparian trees or invisible biota like microbial communities that are a key influence on biogeochemistry. I think the concept of river corridors also helps to make those connections between floodplain channel and riparian zone more explicit. Okay, so what form does spatial heterogeneity or messiness take? Well, just basic dimensions. You can have a heterogeneous stream bed if you have variations in the grain size of sediment, uh, elevation, bed elevation uh, associated with bed forms, or the presence of large wood. You can have variations in the stream banks, anything that makes the bank a knot straight and uniform. There are some small scale embayments and protrusions along the subalpine stream in Wyoming. Uh, those types of irregularities can be associated with vegetation, uh, with constrictions and expansions in the channel cross-section or bends, um, with differences in sediment. If you have big boulders at intervals along the channel or other factors, you can have uh, heterogeneity in the cross-sectional form as a function of bed forms, the presence of meander bends, those expansions and constrictions that I mentioned a moment ago. There are various things that make natural rivers have cross-sectional forms that vary downstream. And you can have heterogeneity in the plan form uh, of both the river and floodplain. The little inset photo here, a meandering channel in Alaska with a series of cutoff meander bends or banded meander bends. So sinuosity, um, multi-channel plan form like braided or anastomosing, those all create a lot of heterogeneity in the plan form. What creates these different forms of spatial heterogeneity? Well, fundamentally, it's fluxes of water and sediment. And again, in forested river corridors, large wood and what I've called uh, biotic drivers, log jams throughout the world and in the northern hemisphere, beaver dams. These uh, create erosion and deposition that is not spatially and temporally uniform. So that creates heterogeneity. 
and typically in the context of lateral channel movement or uh, changes through space and time and things like bed forms, substrate, cross-sectional geometry, and plan form. Okay, so what? Natural rivers are not uniform and homogeneous. Does it make a difference? Uh, it does. And I'm just going to go briefly through a few examples of why it does. Uh, first one, habitat abundance and diversity. This is an underwater view of a channel. The white arrow indicates the flow direction. This is in Rocky Mountain National Park in the mountains. Mostly it's about a 4% gradient in this reach. So there are the very large uh, class that you see in the substrate sort of in mid photo here, uh, meter to submeter diameter boulders. Here there's a channel spanning log jam. You can just see it at left. Uh, there's the, the silvery top of the photo is the underside of the water with a lot of air bubbles. The dark material at the back is a, a very large boulder with flow plunging over it. You can see a, a few of the bubbles for the plunging flow coming in. But you also see in the backwater of this log jam, which spans the entire channel, there's a lot uh, finer grain sediment in the foreground as well as some organic material. And this is prime habitat for salmonids and other types of fish, for macroinvertebrates, for microbial communities. So I was very pleased I put my camera under the water. I couldn't see what I was photographing, but you can see the silhouette of a salmonid enjoying the nice habitat in the background there. And uh, stream ecologists have recognized this for a long time, the importance of wood associated habitat in forested river corridors. This is a, a nice informational sign from the Lolo National Forest in Montana making this point. And to make this a little more visual, I have a GoPro video that I took underwater in this log jam. So we're, this is a very small channel, just a few meters across. There's a channel spanning log jam that you're looking at, um, sort of th the photo's tilted, but um, across the channel and to the right. So we're going to go under the water and see what this backwater looks like at base flow. And what you're going to see is a lot of organic material here, not just the large wood, but lots of fine organic material, twigs, pine cones, bits of leaves and pine needles, lots of attached macrophytes in the form of aquatic bryophytes. And I'm moving towards the log jam here. You can see the upstream end. There's overhead cover, a lot of substrate diversity and crevices. You can see the thalweg of the channel has uh, fairly well sorted sand. That's a little bit cleaner. So basically there's diversity in the channel cross section. And uh, let me just get back to the screen show. Um, in the habitat down there. And again, very nice for fish aquatic macroinvertebrates, microbial communities. So a second implication of spatial heterogeneity is how the river corridor responds to either natural or human disturbance. And resistant systems don't respond very much at all. Resilient systems may respond, but they return to a pre-disturbance state fairly quickly. So some of the primary natural disturbances that are very typically short in duration, wildfire in my part of the world, uh, floods, droughts, and then the more sustained changes often associated with human activities, uh, ongoing climate change or resource use. This is an example of what's sometimes called a beaver meadow complex. This is also in Rocky Mountain National Park, the white in the upper photo, white arrows indicating flow direction. But you can see looking down onto that valley bottom, there are large areas of ponded water. Uh, it's a little bit harder to see, but there are multiple channels that branch and rejoin in an anastomosing platform, plan form. There's multiple beaver colonies and beaver dams down there. And that's actually a very wet valley bottom. This photo was taken in autumn. So the valley bottom is kind of tan colored, but um, it's dense with thick riparian willows. Uh, the ground photo here was taken in early June. The willows are just starting to leaf out. There's three channels that are coming together in that ground photo. It's just hard to see them because of this um, dense riparian vegetation. So this system is extremely resistant and resilient to disturbance. Uh, if there's a fire or a drought, you can see there's a lot of standing water at the surface and the riparian water table is very high. If there's a flood, as there was here in 2013, the flood water spread out through those multiple channels, the ponded areas, the, the densely vegetated floodplain, they lose a lot of energy and attenuate pretty effectively. When I came here after the 2013 flood at the downstream end, I couldn't tell there had been a flood and it's the flood of record for this catchment. When it went upstream, I started to see evidence of deposition of sand and gravel and coarser sediment and large wood at the upstream end of the meadow, but um, the, the main part of the meadow itself changed very little. So here, 
the beavers, the presence of the beavers and their ecosystem alterations are creating spatial heterogeneity. I can contrast that with a site in the catchment just to the north, where there were beavers historically, as recently as uh, the 1980s, they have disappeared and the system has become more homogenous. So as the beaver dams fell into disrepair, peak flows tended to concentrate in a fewer numbers of channel, fewer number of channels. The riparian water table dropped, a lot of the willows died back, it became more like a xeric upland environment. And in 2011, there was an illegal campfire uh, farther up this canyon that got out of control, started a wildfire that burned for months. It burned down into the riparian zone here. And I think if this had still been a more spatially heterogeneous river corridor influenced by beaver activity, it would not have burned. And to emphasize that, this is a photo from my colleague Joe Wheaton, who of course is also winning uh, a BSG award this year. Uh, Joe took this photo a couple of summers ago in Idaho flying over this catchment that had just burned. You can see the uplands were very intensely burned. The river corridor where it's modified by beaver did not burn. So that high riparian water table and lots of standing water made it much more resistant to that particular disturbance. Another implication of spatial heterogeneity is the ability of the river corridor to retain material in flux coming from the uplands or from upstream. And a variety of materials, water, sediment, um, dissolved in particulate nutrients, organic matter, contaminants. Uh, if you have more heterogeneity, that means you've got more attenuation of those fluxes because of zones of flow separation or limited flow. This is a very small scale example. You can literally jump across this channel. It's a couple meters wide. It's got a 7% gradient. So it's steps and pools with big boulders elsewhere. Here there's a small log jam that's formed. You can see it's created a little backwater. There's sand and gravel and organic material that's collecting here. That's a very small log jam. It's probably gonna blow out in a year or two during snowmelt peak flow. But one of the things that microbial ecologists like Tom Batten has shown is that if you stop the movement of nutrients or organic matter, even for a matter of minutes or hours and store it in a place like this, it can increase the access of microbial communities and macroinvertebrates to that material. So you increase the biological availability and uptake. And of course, if you spread material onto the floodplain or uh, shunt it into the hyperreic zone, if it's in solution, you can disperse that material, you may dilute it, uh, which may or may not be desirable, but certainly you increase the retention of the river corridor if you have more spatial heterogeneity. Another implication is that spatial heterogeneity affects connectivity. It can increase or decrease connectivity in different dimensions of it. Uh, here, this is a photo again from Rocky Mountain National Park. At the lower right, you can see what looks like a pile of sticks. That's an abandoned beaver lodge. There are no beaver dams now. But when the beavers were present and creating spatial heterogeneity in this environment, they would have decreased longitudinal connectivity, uh, decreased downstream movement of materials, uh, probably didn't affect upstream movement of organisms. They would have increased, or their activities would have increased lateral connectivity between the channel and floodplain and vertical connectivity between the surface and the subsurface in the hyperreic zone. So it's not that spatial heterogeneity changes connectivity in a, a particular dimension. It doesn't always increase or decrease it, but it affects uh, the three-dimensional connectivity in different ways, depending on the source of the heterogeneity. So applying some of these ideas to the mountain streams that I work on in Rocky Mountain National Park, I borrowed a phrase from Stan Shum. He referred to river metamorphosis of some of the plains rivers in Colorado. What I see in the mountain streams is a metamorphosis over the past century from more spatially heterogeneous to more homogeneous, or simple and uniform. And in these forested catchments with beaver historically, it's largely driven by the presence or absence of log jams, particularly those that span the entire Bankville Channel and beaver dams. And I can explain some of the details of this, uh, starting with log jams. If you have a tree that falls into the channel, one scenario is that it forms what's called a ramped piece, where a portion of the trunk is resting above the high flow level. Um, it could just be resting on the bank under its own weight, or it could be still anchored in the subsurface through roots. But either way, it takes a lot more energy to move that piece than a piece that's entirely in the channel. So it's more stable. It's more likely to trap smaller mobile pieces moving down the channel and to form a channel spanning log jam. 
And the effects of that logjam depend very much on where it occurs in, with respect to valley geometry. Uh, so you can describe it as a threshold in a steep, a narrowly confined valley, so laterally confined. You form the, the log jam and you get a backwater that's local. If it's a steep channel, it only goes maybe one to two times the channel width or extends that far upstream. It's a local effect. It, it doesn't do anything to the floodplain. Uh, in this case, in the, the inset photo, there is no floodplain. And it's transient in that when you have a high peak flow, say the snowmelt peak, there's a lot of hydraulic force exerted on that log jam, both drag and buoyancy. So the log jam is probably going to blow out. Many of these log jams only last a few years, although new ones reform. If you're on the other side of the threshold in a wide, uh, low gradient portion of the valley, particularly one that has old growth forest that can produce a lot of wood and large pieces of wood introduced to the channel, you can have a very different scenario. The backwater extends farther upstream because it's a, a lower gradient of channel. And there's uh, less lateral confinement of the channel, so you're more likely to have either bank erosion or overbank flow where there's an obstacle to flow, such as a channel spanning log jam. That overbank flow or bank erosion can initiate multiple channels, secondary channels that branch from the main channel and rejoin downstream. Each of those channels can have bank recruitment or tree fall into them, so you get more log jam formed and you end up with this spatially extensive uh, scenario that occurs across the entire floodplain. It's a very heterogeneous environment and it's persistent. When you do have a snowmelt peak flow or, or other high flow, a lot of the energy is dissipated as flow across the floodplain. I think of the floodplain as a safety valve for flood energy. So the log jam doesn't have as much force, hydraulic force exerted against it, and it's more likely to persist. I've just finished the 11th year of a study of about a population of about 300 of these channel spanning log jams in the park. And I find that those in these wide low gradient systems tend to last longer than those in the steep narrow systems. So you have the self-enhancing feedback that is indicated by the circle with the arrows here, and you end up with a very resilient portion of the river corridor. There's a lot of habitat, particularly if you've got multiple channels. So there's more cumulative length of channel per length of valley bottom. So you uh, have a lot of biomass. You often have high biodiversity because of the diversity of, of habitats present. And there's a lot of organic carbon stock, both in terms of soil organic carbon because of the um, high riparian water table and reducing conditions in the soil and because of the large amount of downed wood. An analog for beavers, uh, you've seen the active beaver meadow above. If the beavers disappear for some reason, so they're removed by humans or they are outcompeted for uh, woody grazing material by wild ungulates as occurring in Rocky Mountain National Park, it's elk and moose, or by domestic cattle, whatever causes a beaver to disappear. If their dams disappear or fall into disrepair, it's the scenario I talked about previously for Moraine Park with that wildfire. You're more likely to have the flow concentrated in a single channel and that single channel is unstable. The banks often erode, uh, partly because they're not stabilized by the roots of the woody riparian vegetation. So you can see the eroding banks here, the channel cuts downward the riparian water table drops and you go to a scenario that ecologists refer to as an elk grassland. So the panoramic view on the bottom here, you can see a few remnant willows in that valley bottom. It's very green because I took this photo in June, so it's still wetter than the adjacent uplands, but it's, there's no standing water, no ponds, uh, and a single deeply incised channel that you can see it left. So it is drier than the active beaver meadow. And to illustrate this from Marine Park, the site that I showed you a ground photo of that burned, uh, the photo in 1964 is when multiple beaver colonies were still present in that valley bottom. You can see that it's a very nice uh, multi-thread channel pattern. By 1987, the beavers are almost gone. Uh, you've reverted or you've gone to about three active channels. Today, there's one main channel and a secondary channel that's on its way to becoming inactive. The numbers at the upper right here on the left-hand column are calendar years, so 1940 um, to 1999. The numbers at the right are populations of the animals. So beavers go down dramatically with time in the national park and elk go up. The two photos at the bottom are not to scale. Uh, the elk are much, much larger than the beaver. The elk would be at even higher numbers than 3,000, except that the Park Service has undertaken various population control measures. Uh, there's been controlled shoots or hunting, which the pub is not very publicly, uh, very, not very popular. 
they've used contraceptives. Um, something has just happened within the last few months that I'm very excited about. Uh, wolves were hunted to extinction in the national park uh, in the 1920s, but wolves have just re reintroduced themselves to Colorado from uh, Wyoming, which is to the north of us. And if they can survive, um, they can get to the park, they will grow fat and lazy because there are so many elk to feed on. We also have a ballot initiative coming up in November to reintroduce wolves to Colorado, uh, probably southern Colorado. But I'm very, very excited of the possibility that we'll see the scenario that has played out in Yellowstone National Park where the reintroduction of wolves has resulted in a transformation of the river corridors as it's not that the elk are, are no longer there, they just don't spend all their time camped out eating riparian vegetation. So the beavers have a chance as does the riparian vegetation. So this is Marine Park on the ground. Um, it's beautiful. It's a very iconic view in Rocky Mountain National Park. I think it's analogous to that boy and the dog on the fishing on the banks of the river in England. It's very attractive, but it's not really natural. If you look at those shrubby willows on the left there, they're the remnant of what would have been a continuous dense willow community across the entire valley bottom in a very wet valley bottom with multiple channels. So it's not that um, simpler rivers aren't attractive, they can be very attractive, but they're not necessarily as functional or healthy. So in these mountain rivers, when you have those sources of obstructions, log jams or beaver dams, you have all these secondary effects, overbank floods, a lot of infiltration and hyperic exchange, so a high water table, surface and subsurface exchange with subsurface water storage in the hyperic zone and processes like denitrification, a very complex channel pattern, of branching and rejoining channels, more storage of fine sediment, more storage of dissolved and particulate nutrients and organic matter, and much greater biodiversity. Ecologists have shown um, biodiversity of everything from bacteria through mammals, um, vegetation, pretty much everything they've looked at is more diverse in beaver meadows. So coming back to that idea of stream metamorphosis, what I see is that these rivers have become more homogenous and they've become leaky. They're less retentive material. I'm showing some of the former sources of heterogeneity, beaver dam at the upper left and log jam at the lower right. As those are lost, water, sediment, nutrients all move downstream more rapidly with the loss of spatial heterogeneity. Okay, so coming back to the idea of healthy, um, healthy river health is a concept that many river scientists are not that comfortable with because it's kind of nebulous and hard to define or hard to measure, but it is a concept that resonates with people who are not scientists. If you say a river is healthy or unhealthy, there are immediate implications. Uh, people can immediately grasp what you're getting at. Oh yeah, if it's healthy, if it's functioning as it should, maybe they're more likely to think of it as an ecosystem. If it's unhealthy, uh, there are problems, whatever has caused those, and maybe there's more need for management to try and um, improve the health of the river. So a few examples. Uh, organic carbon sequestration. Uh, this is based on Nick Sutfin's dissertation work, and it shows very strikingly that River corridors have a very high potential for organic carbon storage and sequestration, uh, much more so than uplands in many cases. So in these mountain river networks, we found that those wide low gradient valley segments are less than a quarter of the total river length, but they store about three quarters of the carbon present in the valley bottoms. And the river corridor as a whole throughout the river network is less than 1% of the area in the watershed, but it sto stores about a quarter of the total carbon. And this is carbon in the form of soil organic carbon, down dead wood, and living vegetation. So essentially, the, the floodplains are key here. The floodplains have higher primary productivity, uh, so there's more vegetation, there's more dead wood, and they also have wetter soils. So there's often reducing environments and a much greater concentration of soil organic carbon in the soils than in the uplands. A second uh, set of studies, this was much of this was uh, Bridget Liver's PhD work. It was a big collaborative project. So Bridget showed that there was more channel spatial heterogeneity, more organic matter stored and organic carbon in the form of down wood and fine material in the channel and in the floodplain. And then our collaborators on this project showed that that spatial heterogeneity equated to greater uptake of nitrate and nitrate is a severe pollutant in these otherwise pristine mountain systems because of um, atmospheric inputs. 
Uh, they also showed that there was a lot of both biodiversity and biomass in the uh, things that we measured, the organisms we measured that eat insects. So fish and riparian spiders, uh, there would also presumably be more biomass and diversity in uh, birds and in uh, bats, which also eat these aquatic insects. The, the, the key here was that, again, you had more length of channel and habitat per unit length of valley because of the spatial heterogeneity in the presence of multiple channel, multi-thread channel plan form. So you get a lot more productivity for aquatic insects. Another study looking at beaver meadows specifically and their attenuation of fluxes, including carbon. This was Deanna Laurel's PhD work. And on the lower right, that's an abandoned incised beaver dam um, that I've just highlighted to make it easier to see and the flow direction indicated by the arrow. We found that beaver meadows attenuate downstream fluxes of everything, uh, water, fine sediment, particular organic matter, nutrients and dissolved form. And these functions decline when the beaver are no longer present in maintaining their dam. So relic beaver meadows, you still have a wide valley bottom uh, with a big floodplain. So they do store more carbon than the uh, per unit area than the steep narrow portions of the valley. But they store a lot more when the beavers are maintaining the dams and you've got saturated soils and reducing conditions and a lot of organic matter inputs. Okay, so I've been focusing on streams in the mountains of Colorado, but they're not unique relative to the rest of the world. Globally, we've reduced forest cover by about half from its Holocene extent and old growth is almost gone. Um, looking at what this means in terms of what ecologists refer to as alternative states, the idea of an alternative state is that you can have an ecosystem or a portion of a landscape that can have two or more uh, stable persistent configurations. Those are alternatives to each other. Something, some type of disturbance or input of energy shifts the ecosystem from one to another. So looking at a river corridor in large wood, what would be sort of the default or natural condition in a forested catchment would be wood rich. I, you know, I use these very technical terms of wood rich and wood poor for the alternative states. In a naturally forested catchment, you have fluctuation through time and space and the amount of wood coming into the channels. You have wildfires, insect infestations, blowdowns, etc. cetera. But there's always some wood in the channel. Uh, the wood just doesn't decay that fast. So if there's some wood in the channel, it's very effective at trapping more wood. You can create the big log jams that you see here that completely span the channel. And they do uh, sometimes disappear. They come and go, they fall apart and they reform, but there's always some wood. On the other hand, if you pull all the wood out, which is something that humans have been doing for centuries in some parts of the world and for millennia in others, and or you remove all the forest cover, you go to a wood poor state. And it's not just a quick, you know, takes the trees 60 years to regrow, then you can go back to wood rich, return to wood rich. If you look at the uh, tree that's leaning way over the channel here, if it falls in, there's not much to trap it. Uh, that's a pretty straight uniform channel with no wood in it. So that tree is gonna go downstream. So studies both in the Western US and in Australia suggest that you need something like 200 years to, restore, to return to a wood rich state once wood removal and deforestation stops. So it's a long recovery period. Uh, beaver, similarly for the Northern Hemisphere, um, I have never seen a population estimate for historic populations of beaver in Eurasia, but there were a lot of them and there are very few now. In North America, population estimates range widely, anywhere from 60 to 400 million. At present, we probably have something like 12 million. So we have far fewer beavers. When the beavers are present, they it's the presence of their dams. And even on big rivers, you know, of course a, a beaver can't dam a big river, but it can dam parts of the floodplain. Uh, beavers commonly build dam across dams across seeps and springs on hill slopes, and they build them those dams on floodplains as well. So they can engineer or modify the floodplains of even very large rivers. And while they're present and their beaver dams are maintained, you have beaver meadows. When they disappear, you've seen this photo before, you go to the elk grassland state. So if you're in an elk grassland and you want to return to a beaver meadow, um, it's not as simple as dropping off a pair of mated beavers and saying, be fruitful and multiply. If you drop them off in this scenario on the right, um, beavers are herbivores. Um, contrary to C.S. Lewis, they do not eat fish. They only eat vegetation. 
Uh, they eat herbaceous vegetation and grasses during the summer, but they require woody vegetation to survive in the winter. They can also build dams that are just composed of sediment, but those dams are more resistant if they have some wood in them. So if you put beaver in this scenario or in this location on the right, they wouldn't be able to survive. You have to have a regrowth of woody deciduous riparian vegetation, things like aspens, willows, cottonwoods, birch, before the beaver can survive. So in the channel on the right, you either have to remove the ungulates and the grazing pressure or put in fences for grazing exclosures, replant um, woody riparian vegetation or all of those and wait a while uh, before you can reintroduce beaver. Or you could put in structures uh, that are called different things. Sometimes they're called beaver dam analogs. They're like they're human-made beaver dams. And if there is building material and enough food for them, the beaver can come back and build on top of those. But you need something other than just um, the existing conditions to return from an elk grassland to a beaver meadow. Okay, so spatial heterogeneity has all these wonderful ecosystem benefits, but how much do you need? Well, again, it depends on where you are in the world and where you are in the catchment and, and what's happened in the past. In much of the world, we cannot go back to a pristine uh, reference condition, natural conditions, because of continuing land use. But understanding the history of that land use and the environmental context and natural range of variability can help to inform river management. It, uh, spatial heterogeneity and the functions it creates are not an either or scenario. It's not all or nothing. You can have um, some restoration of heterogeneity and ecosystem benefits, even if there are still uh, human constraints and land use constraints. So the environmental context, you know, three randomly chosen places around the world, Sardinia, Borneo, Colorado. I've been focusing on beaver dams and log jams in the mountain streams of Colorado. Those are not the primary sources of, they're not sources of heterogeneity much at all in Sardinia and Borneo, but there are other processes that create heterogeneity. So that's what I mean by environmental context, understanding how that river corridor operates and what are the sources and forms of heterogeneity. And one way to think about this is using this nice diagram from Knighton's 98 text on fluvial forms and processes where he was referring to differing uh, spatial and temporal scales of response or adjustment in streams from things like the dunes and ripples in a sand bed that respond quickly over small spatial scales to the gradient or concavity of the entire um, the profile of the entire river network. So at those large time and space scales, you've got the big controls like climate and tectonics. For all of the others, the intermediate to short time scales and smaller spatial scales, realistically, humans dominate in much of the world, certainly in the temperate latitude, uh, either indirectly through land use occurring in the catchment or directly through engineering in the river corridor. And the net effect of those abilities has primarily been to reduce spatial heterogeneity and the functions that result from it. So now, of course, a lot of river management and restoration is trying to restore some of that spatial heterogeneity. But one of the big questions is how much? Let's say you, you have a nitrate problem in a channel and you want to increase hyperic exchange. So you put in an engineered log jam or some large boulders or a meander bin to increase hyperic exchange. Well, how much hyperic exchange do you get for that increase in spatial heterogeneity? And how much does that decrease nitrate levels? Those are questions we really can't begin to answer in most cases in um, quantitatively. We can do it qualitatively. So I think going forward, we really need uh, integrated numerical models to improve our predictive capability. And I say this as someone who is not a modeler, who's a field person, but I enjoy working with modelers who use field data to parameterize their models and calibrate and test them. So we've, as a community, have come a long way in coupled hydraulic and sediment transport models. We're just starting to incorporate large wood and other sources of spatial heterogeneity. But I think continuing that and viewing those outputs explicitly in the context of river corridor spatial heterogeneity and then the effects of that heterogeneity on things like three-dimensional fluxes of various materials and what you could call the ecosystem services such as organic carbon stock or biomass is the way we should be going in future and this is going to be a big challenge uh, because most of these systems are non-linear so we have to understand and include the thresholds 
but those thresholds are very important in the response of what we're whatever it is we're trying to achieve with our management and restoration. So my hope is that uh, people beyond the river science community look at a river corridor like this, which is in Glacier National Park in Montana, and don't just say mm, somebody should get that wood out of there and and make that channel a uh, single thread, make it you know a little bit more accessible, and maybe clear out some of that riparian veg. Um, but instead, they embrace the, the messiness or the spatial heterogeneity of this view and, and think about the fluxes in three dimensions that are creating and maintaining it and the effect of those fluxes in ecosystem services such as organic carbon stocks in dead vegetation or living vegetation that's what the brown swaths are supposed to indicate or biomass and biodiversity and remember that all of this occurs in the context of a river corridor so the channel is intimately connected to the adjacent floodplain and the underlying hyperreic zone. And coming back to that idea of perceptions, um, I asked one of our grad students who's a good artist to re-envision the drawing on the left. And here's what she came up with. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to the dog, but the boy is now catching a fish. And I think it's a little more representative of a really um, especially heterogeneous and functional river corridor in the UK. There's woody riparian vegetation of differing ages, as indicated by the green patch. There's downed dead wood. There's um, some heterogeneity of the water surface, indicating bed forms. There's a little secondary channel that's cutting across the uh, inside of that point bar. There's more variability along the river banks in terms of substrate and vegetation. Uh, so I think it's it's a bit more realistic, and I personally, because of my experience, think it's just as attractive or more attractive than that earlier drawing. But this can be um, a little bit of a, a hard sell to some people. And as an example of that, and I should mention, there, there's some nice studies that have looked at um, people's perceptions of river corridors and clearly show that uh, features like braided channels or multiple channels and large wood in the channel are not commonly perceived as attractive or beneficial. So one final example of this, this is a river restoration project undertaken in the Italian Dolomites. And you can see in the photo in 2005, those white lines across the channel are grade control structures. The banks were stabilized uh, for almost continuously. The floodplain is occupied uh, by towns, roads, um, agricultural fields, recreational fields. After a restoration project, they did not restore this river corridor to a pristine completely spatially heterogeneous state. You've still got the communities, the roads, the land use, but they remove some of the grade control structures or replace them with lines of large boulders that are more like uh, naturally occurring boulder steps. They took out a lot of the uh, bank stabilization and bank hardening, and they went to something that's a braided plan form that would have been uh, the natural condition prior to a lot of human manipulation of the uplands in this valley bottom. And when they first undertook this, uh, there was a lot of public resistance. People were very suspicious. They didn't think braided rivers were natural or attractive or healthy. Uh, they were able to undertake the project uh, despite that public resistance or community resistance. When I visited in 2018, I was there in November and it was not a very nice day. It was cold and it was drizzling rain. There were so many people out along that river corridor. Uh, many of these bars have become vegetated with grasses and willows. So there were people walking, jogging, out with their dogs. There were people bird watching, people fishing. This project has now won a prize from the European Union for river restoration, and it's a source of great local pride in the community. And people's perceptions of this river corridor and this alpine setting have changed dramatically. So, this type of effort gives me hope, and that's why I think it's important that we as a river science community explicitly talk about river corridors and the fact that naturally functioning river corridors may not meet our preconceived notions of what an attractive river looks like, but maybe we need to think more carefully and, and re-examine some of those preconceived notions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen, for a truly wonderful uh, Linton Award lecture. Uh, we're very privileged to have you here and I hope you'll be able to answer a few questions uh, from us. I am here and happy to answer questions. Fantastic. So I first of all have a question uh, from, sorry I've now lost it, uh, from Dewey Roberts who loved your talk and said with your experience and expertise with rivers 
and knowing the impact people have on them, e.g. dams, channel straightening, how confident are you that rivers can be more heterogeneous in the future? <laughs> You're asking me in the era of COVID and a Trump administration in the US how hopeful I am about the future. Um, I, am, I am confident that it can happen. I am hopeful that it will happen. I think the whole river science community and many other communities such as environmentalists need to be engaged in this. Uh, I, I think it's a perception issue and the metaphor I sometimes use is think about the rainforest versus the jungle. Jungle uh, through time came to have very negative connotations. Think of Heart of Darkness, Joseph Conrad's novel. Rainforest, if you say tropical rainforest, people tend to have more positive images. They think of biodiversity and the importance for absorbing carbon. So if we can change people's perceptions of rivers as ecosystems, I think we have the potential to manage to make them more heterogeneous. And I listened to Joe's talk before, um, mostly not listening to my own again. And somewhere in there, there was a discussion about um, the opportunities that extreme events prevent, present where you can change land use when there have been hazards and damage. So uh, you can sometimes move communities out of the floodplain or change the land use patterns. Those are great opportunities to introduce more natural heterogeneity in river corridors. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Um, next question is from Mike Kirkby. Uh, your examples seem to focus on a certain medium size of channels in which biotic interactions dominate. In much larger rivers, do other factors create the same essential heterogeneity with less biotic influences? Yes, and I should explain, I was using the mountain rivers uh, in Colorado because they're in my backyard and I've worked in them a lot. But certainly the types of things I'm talking about here, I think apply to rivers of any size. I have also been working in the Mackenzie River, which is um, the largest river in Canada, it drains into the Arctic Ocean. And we've been looking at the effects of wood there and riparian vegetation. And that's even in that huge river um, down wood, there's granted there are very large quantities of it. And riparian vegetation are critical in creating influences. And I think you know, Angela Gurnell's work, uh, Dove Cornblit and others have shown this very nicely that there's a spectrum of what you could call biotic physical interactions across different types of rivers and different sizes of rivers. But I think even in the places I've been that are hyper arid, um, like the Negev Desert, for example, or parts of South, South Africa, and Stephen Tooth can talk to this, riparian vegetation can be very important. There may not be a lot of it, and there may not be much down wood, but the, the living vegetation can be very important in creating heterogeneity, influencing erosional and depositional patterns and channel plan form. Excellent, thank you. Um, I'm also gonna post a couple of questions in a minute, which are more like comments. So I'm not actually going to put them to you uh, face to face as it were, but you can see them in the Q and A uh, as, and so can everybody. Um, but I think the last question really, which I'd like to, to, to ask you is, um, you're super um, positive about all this, even in the, the face of Trumpdom and all the other <laughs> lunacies in the, in the world. Um, but to what extent do you think all these principles are relevant to much more urbanized settings? Can we have messier, healthy, um, but also urban rivers and, and live alongside them? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and I would say absolutely, because I, I really want to emphasize that I don't see healthy or spatially heterogeneous or pristine or whatever phrase you want to use as an either or. I see it as a continuum. So there is the extreme in urban rivers are that they're in a pipe and you don't even see them because they're underground or they're in a completely concrete channel. But many um, urban areas are realizing that that river can be an amenity if you have even something like walkways or a, a very small inset floodplain along it. So there is the potential to create, even if it's relatively small scale spatial heterogeneity, everything helps. And I think there, there is more of a trend, at least in the highly industrialized world to restore slightly more um, natural river corridors. You get a variety of functions from those, uh, of course, in terms of clean water, biodiversity, flood attenuation, as well as aesthetic and economic benefits to the community. And probably one of the ones that attracted the most attention initially was the river walk in um, San Antonio, Texas, where instead of putting the river at the bottom of a concrete canal, they 
um, created a little bit of space along the channel. There's uh, riparian, woody riparian vegetation down there. There are restaurants, um, shops, and it's a very pleasant place to be in what's often a very hot city. And I think other, I, I mean, literally the air temperature is very warm there. Um, I think other communities are doing that as well. Fantastic answer. And uh, Ellen, I'd like to thank you and all the other speakers today for a fantastic selection of talks covering a huge canvas of geomorphological topics, um, making us remember how important uh, we are as a group of scientists and practitioners uh, for uh, having practical applications to our research, uh, but also carrying out uh, cutting edge science at the uh, theoretical uh, end of the subject. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Stephen Tooth for uh, doing the bulk of the chairing and also all the other people who've helped uh, chair sessions. Um, I would like also to thank Chris Skinner who put together um, all this fantastic infrastructure um, and got us all uh, up and running properly. And in particular, and most specially, I'd like to thank Josh Ahmed who stood in at the last minute. If you want to see how he's been surviving the day, please look at the photo he posted of himself on Twitter uh, early on. Um, if you were in the room at the BSG proper meeting, Josh, I would instantly take you to the bar um, and buy you a refreshing drink. Um, and I'd also like to thank everybody who's joined in with us today, asked questions, joined the chat, um, and bore with us as well while we had a few uh, technical issues earlier on. So with that, I'm going to close this uh, part of the session and leave it up to Josh or Stephen if they want to say uh, any final words. Thank you very much. <laughs>